So, a long-lasting nuclear 0.3 kiloton plasma weapon. Does the military have such weapons? We don't know. But the observed fact is just a strong and long-lasting radiation source was present. And it's indeed a strange weapon, and it's no, no surprise that we have a headache and that we are trying to figure out already nearly 20 years what was going on. We had radiation phenomena up to one hour prior to collapse. We had an extreme energy input in the ground three months active. We find no crater. We find only a seismic activity, a small seismic activity, a small rumble in the ground, nothing more. And the weapon, worst of all, survives for a prolonged period of time. We don't know of any weapon which is capable of surviving uh, for a prolonged period of time and producing so much energy output. We have no lethal radioactive radiation on place. We have survivors in the North Tower at this level, approximately. We had a pyroclastic flow of hot dust after collapse of several miles wide. We have no cavity below the towers, as should be predicted or as should be expected, but we have a confirmed gas flow from below. So the gas were shooting up, but there seems to be no origin. We have the dustification of iron and concrete, where the paper remains intact. We have molten steel coming out of the building. And we have sudden inflammation of cars and buildings nearby. This is really as people more and more state a futuristic design, a super weapon, or can it be old technology? And again, nature. Nature, you explain it all. During my 9-11 research, I literally stumbled across the feature that nature itself can form a nuclear reactor not only in the Sun, which is a natural fusion reactor, but also on Earth, where under certain conditions the uranium ore starts to behave like a controlled and regulated nuclear fission mm. reactor. In short, fission and fusion reactions can occur in a natural environment without the need of a complex control system. It just works all by itself. And the example is in Africa, so we travel from Stromboli, the island of Stromboli, to Congo, and the reactor was also a nuclear fuel breeder. This means it produced more nuclear fuel than it consumed by uh, side effects. So, we already have learned today that, that in presence of water, or a moderator, the neutrons slow down. So, the water starts the process. And suddenly you have a uh, nuclear pulsator. This natural reactor was moderated by the flow of groundwater, which resulted in a cycle duration of two hours. The fission process started as soon as water was present and the sandstone contained at least 10% of uranium. The fission inside the uranium heat heated the clay up to a temperature of 400 degrees. The water evaporated, so the moderator was absent. The fast neutrons escaped and the process stopped until groundwater or rain uh, reactivated it. We also learn from this example, from this natural uh, example, that we can have various forms and geometries of this reactor. So, the, the biggest had a length of 12 meters and a width of 80 meters, and uh, there's the smallest uh, was just a few meters in size. So you don't need a perfect geometrical uh, design to have such a process work. Well, now it's a, it was my ideas. I was experimenting and thinking about what could have been in, in the towers and how could we, deact could we activate such a thing. So we could use a thorium um, a thorium jacket and the thorium is a non-radioactive element which can be transformed by neutron absorption into a fissionable uh, uranium uh, atom. So uh, we had a process which would 
be innocuous at a at the beginning, but it would gain speed and speed and uh, explode after a time after breeding enough nuclear fuel. The problem with this process, the waiting time is too too long. So we have 27 days to go uh, to wait until this sphere reaches supercriticality and explodes. So we have one hour. So nonetheless, it can be dangerous. Of course, you can put such a uranium sphere, and it will be cause great harm, especially if you don't know the cause. Chapter nine, upside down. This chapter is about the devil's trick: how he fooled us with the 911 device. We can read about a lot about nuclear bombs on Wikipedia, but little about neutron flux control. If you control neutron flux, neutron speed, and neutron reflection, you control the nuclear device, whatever it might be. Well, upside down means also that uh, we have uh, people uh, whom we trust or trusted, uh, the young man. Uh, got his Nobel Peace Prize for his idea to free the world of nuclear weapons, but he meant to free the world of big nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. He poured billions of dollars into development of small mini and micro nukes so that they can be used in a possible war. So militarization and belittlement and strategic positioning within the EU was uh, what followed. As I said, if you control the neutron flux, a neutron speed, and neutron reflection, you control the weapon. We, as uh, the people, understand only we don't want these weapons at all, at least at all on our doorsteps. Um, but we have already learned nukes are not more anymore just a fireball, but we can also have just like an umbrella blast, a vertically upshooting pressure wave or an invisible radiation flash. Experiments have been made in the 70s where a uranium and uh, reflection disk was inserted in a nuclear reactor. So the, the, the sphere or the, the, the disk r rotates and causes 400 megawatt pulses, but this is a mechanical thing. We have also other devices. This is a development from the 1990s. A fast pulse reactor, which can produce 850 megawatt per pulse. These pulses are very energetic, but they are also very, very short in time. They are short-lived, and these machines need extreme cooling because they produce too much uh, energy. They would melt up. And I was in, in this, uh, in this uh, situation that uh, a device, as proposed, for example, by Dr. Judy Wood, which could produce enormous uh, focused radiation energy at a certain point, would require themselves a lot of cooling. And uh, there's no need to have cooling when you nonetheless want to heat the rock up. So I was in a, in a fix. The devil's trick. He has forced a technical mind on us. But the 911 device was copied from nature. How it could work? Um, we know that a nuclear weapon can detonate only if the uranium is pure. So weapon-grade uranium has a certain cleanness or poorness. And uh, if you if you if you pollute it with uh, a material. Neutron flux will not be sufficient to have an explosion. But we are, we were looking for, I was looking for a process which would run for one hour and um, end with an explosion. An explosion with, which uh, had a duration of about six seconds. So I've made now an example how this could work. Sophisticated. So, I borrowed this from my daughter. All right. Uh, you have a neutron stopper which is inserted into a uranium, a polluted uranium sphere. 
you extract this neutron stopper and the weapon is now live. Then you need an additional energy flash or neutron source which comes there and this polluted uranium sphere will start to melt in the rock, embedded in the rock. Once liquid, the polluted material, or the pollution material, like metal, like beryllium, will go up and separate itself from the uranium. And beryllium is, by the way, a perfect neutron reflector. So you have a uranium sphere which is growing hotter and hotter and it's getting poorer and poorer. And you have a reflection layer on top which is growing in size. If these things separate and the rain sinks to the ground 20 meters and the layer is swimming upwards or as a gaseous substance, then you have a certain critical distance where the fast neutrons which are emitted by this uranium sphere are moderated to a degree and reflected and, uh, and moderated that they have exactly the speed needed to induce more fission and the fission thistle reaction can take place. So we have the situation that the uranium core sinks down as, as a, like mercury in water and it's getting cleaner and cleaner until uh, reaching criticality and then the fist reaction will start. And then I was looking for an artificial neutron source as well and found that also beryllium is used for a, a neutron source when helium is present, helium or alpha particles. So with this configuration we have a fusion layer which is up and a fission layer which is down whereby the fusion layer will be powered from the fission process from below. I'm now showing this in the effect. It's not difficult, it's just a recipe. Cooking a beef broth and you have always the grease swimming on top and not the meat or the bone. It's, no nucle it's not magic, but it is made a secret. I would call this not a fourth generation nuclear weapon, but an imperfect fusion or an imperfect fission. It is one hour cooking time. We have a separation of the clean uranium and the grease on top. We have extreme gamma radiation to the fusion process which occurs in this layer. And we have the neutrons reflected and slowed down. And we have a guaranteed fissile explosion. How would this work? under the towers. So the ignition is due to the Chernobyl effect, a positive feedback. This is exactly what at the Chernobyl reactor happened. The fast neutrons escaped but were reflected back and had unfortunately exactly the needed energy or the needed speed to induce a fissile explosion in the uranium core of this Chernobyl reactor and the thing blew up. So the system is under control if the fast neutrons escape and the, fit and the system explodes if they are reflected back and have the right energy. Here you have the uranium sphere. To do simple buoyancy the plasmatic needle is pushing upwards and you have a plasma dome, let's say yes, 20, 40 meters, well 20 meters here in the distance and 40 meters from, from bottom to top which is pushing itself upwards. So in, in these pictures I'm not anymore uh, presenting a sphere like Kalesov did, but I'm presenting a needle which is growing and growing in its plasma dome of uh, extremely pressurized rock is growing and pushing upwards. So this is the top winner. Um, it replaces the high-tech model of third and fourth generation nukes. We have the length of the process is one hour. The method of destruction is hard gamma radiation and a gas eruption. The method of containment in the nuclear fluid is the rock bed. The source of gamma radiation, this is gamma radiation, is a long-lasting, so long-penetrating, deeply penetrating radiation. Is helium, nuclei and beryllium. This is in the reflector layer. We have the criticality of the system achieved via the uranium process and the ignition 
will be due to a positive feedback of thermal neutron flux after downwelling of the concentrated uranium pulp. It is after all primitive but effective. It can be regarded as a relatively clean uh, uh, process due to the downwelling of the propelling charged uranium. What is exploding, preparing and uh, breaking through the rock is the plasma dome with the with the fusion layer and not the fission uh, pulp which is on the very top. So this is a physical model. A physical model might be flawed but this is the best explanation of the phenomena which I've found so far. So now the physical destruction model similar to that one which I presented last time but made as a three-dimensional drawing it explains the question, where's the cavity, why is the cavity and the crater missing, why were the seismic recordings of so low intensity and why were there no reports of radioactivity, where does the dust come from and so on. So this is the model. This is the south tower. The north tower only a little bit a stump. Here's the charge and maybe Maybe we had additional rotating neutron f reflectors. I don't think that they were necessary. Uh, but uh, as, for example, Jim Fetzer states that we had mini ukes here at the tower, so I placed them as an option. So we had, as the first step, the plane impacting, which opened the building on top. And at the same time, the boron neutron stopper was already. Um, removed and the weapon was activated. This is the second step. Radiation input is growing and in the meantime we had observation as an observation we had the elevator shafts exploded by classical charges. So this is an interpretation we were connecting the chimney as we were creating the nuclear chimney by connecting the elevator shafts by classical explosives and cover charge. So uh, Richard Gage is entirely correct when he, he says that uh, thermate and cutter charges were applied. Then third step we had increasing neutron flux and that's the time when the choppers did register these uh, radiation phenomena, the growing input in the earth of energy input and the rock, the rock is liquefied slowly. We had audio, audio recordings of explosions and, and the helium beryllium fusion layer started to be activated in the meantime. <coughs> so this is shortly before explosion. We observed only the outflow of liquid material on top. A car started to, suddenly to inflame um, and this is a planned structural weakening, so the gamma and extra radiation producing this cone, we have the, uh, the steam escaping and the liquid metal coming down. Then we had the earthquake, this is the fission, the fissile reaction, so the slow nuclear explosion lasting six uh, seconds, producing a weak earthquake 10 seconds prior to collapse and producing a strong EMP registered in the chopper's uh, video uh, cameras. So this is the main explosion and we have the uranium fission, uh, fission and the helium beryllium fusion at its maximum. Then we have the delay I've spoken of and uh, this is where the tower already had uh, uh, had been shocked uh, several times but uh, the effects were not yet visible for the public but nonetheless the plasma was already uh, there to erupt. Then the needle is pushing upwards as the second peak up here he broke through the rock and here this entire bed is uh, liquefied or um, at least um, semi-fluid. Interesting at this point is to understand that the melting point of granite can be lowered 
due to pressure. So if you have strong pressure forces, it can go down up, uh, going to 600 uh, degrees. Well, I calculated 950 to have a reliable figure. The melting point of iron is 1,500. The boiling point for evaporating iron is 2,800. We also found uh, molybdenum, uh, small <coughs> droplets which require 4,000 degrees Celsius. So it's just a plasmatic needle is in the tower, and still nothing is visible to the outstanders. This is the first time when the plasmatic needle reaches the top that the uh, tower exhales suddenly and, um, and we see the first outbreak of steam and dust when the plasmatic needle already reaches the top followed by a pressure wave. The center core is already totally evaporated. And next is step 10, taken from the south, uh, the riddle within the riddles, we had an inclination of 15 degrees of this top uh, of this top block which started to rotate and suddenly stopped rotating. This is absolutely inexplainable except you have a force, a pressure force, a spike acting from below which holds the angular momentum in free fall because if one object is, is rotating and in free fall it can, can, can't stop it during the process. You need an additional force and this is exactly the spike from below, the pressure wave which, uh, which hit the, the, the rotating block from below, halted and dissolved it. So here, here the picture where the block suddenly halted and it goes down at 15 degrees and disappears completely. Then we have the mushrooming. The cloud is already um, the, the, the top. The block is already totally dissipated, and the the outshooting material just uh, reveals itself. Now uh, we have outshooting scripts at the facade. This is pressure deviation, and um, many people always say this is impossible because. Um, because, uh, well, a nuke would have to the, the destroy the towers from, from, from down to top. Well, I have here a sophisticated model of the South Tower. And uh, we know this trick. If you have a gas jet blowing through this uh, paper streamer, it will be actually destroyed from top down or from the part which is farthest away from, from the nozzle or from my from mouth in this case. So. Uh, this is due to the sudden expansion of the gases when they can escape and the destructive forces uh, actually formed a small vortex or a soliton, this, uh, this gas jet, and the destruction will be indeed from top down if the gas jet goes uh, from, 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 from the bottom. And. Uh, <coughs> Then we had the parabolic material ejection and the bursting of floor cells. This, I think, is a very curious error made by the architects and engineers. This bursting of floor cells is not because there were explosives at this level still applied. It was due to the construction of the tower that each level had its own stability strength and with the outshooting pressure here, it was indeed destroyed floor by floor, as this is also destroyed ring by ring. So this piff puff is, uh, is due to the segmentation of the structure of the buildings. Uh, yes, now uh, the solution of this riddle, Silverstein Valley, how was it created? You see, if this rock has been liquefied during one hour and suddenly the gas chamber, after an explosion, uh, hits the counterforce, it will contract and spew the contents out. But while spewing the contents out, it, 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 it sucks any other liquid rock into its position, and uh, due to gravity, the valley could have been, could have been created just by flowing down into the cavity. So the cavity, the cavity itself empties itself from the nuclear plasma and the, the rock in the vicinity just follows due to gravitation and the, 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 the sucking in from the semi-liquid 
rock. And this would be a perfect explanation for first the creation of silver steel valley and the old mock structures, and second the missing cavity which we didn't find below the tower. Then we have the fountain formation of dust and debris. The, the viscous rock is further sinking down. And we have the formation of black and white zones in the dust cloud, so the evaporated central black uh, core of the steel and uh, white concrete, which is radiation pulverized. And um, the gas jets, which here shown were next to the Twin Towers, which did appear exactly where the, uh, where the wastewater channels <coughs> were. So the wastewater channels are displayed here and here. Of course, uh, through this, uh, these channels, the steam could escape and break out at a different uh, position. I'm just playing this. I have shown this video clip before. It's five minutes, just that you see the force of the, the event. Keep in mind, just as when, when I was starting this clip, you see at this point from the south tower for a split second uh, the, the white escaping steam. Uh, eruption, the white. So this is the white steam erupting. Same same situation here the white steam in front of the black in front of the black uh, iron cloud. Same situation without sound. The, the south tower coming down here's the eruption of the gases in front of the black cloud out of the earth. and it just collapsed. Look at this. Unbelievable.
Watching all day, this is like watching the collapse of an active volcano, and the dust uh, from it is is not unlike that from a volcano. We are on the phone with uh, New York Fire Department Lieutenant. And it does appear that building number seven has just collapsed. We've been telling you that that building was on fire. Building number seven at the trade complex has now apparently collapsed. We also have reports that building number five might be on fire too, but now a huge amount of smoke and debris now up in that area again because of this building number seven going down. Okay, so we had these uh, gas uh, eruptions uh, to, to, to the steering water system. We had still standing structures, the so-called spire, which is typical if you have a shot out of the ground that some structures will remain standing, which are near to the, to the ground. You remember also the bee, uh, which is near the nozzle of the escaping gases. We have this standing cloud stem right here is observed, especially pronounced for the North Tower, which is just an effect of cohesion of the hot gases. And Silverstein Valley is still in creation during this time. Uh, here, this, uh, this avalanche of pyroclastic uh, dust um, created also camera scintillation, so camera fails in the cameras of the people which were engulfed into the dust cloud and to produce colorful stripes. And here, yeah. as I've said, Silverstein Valley explained to the downwelling process. And uh, here is a, a three-dimensional image. At uh, 30 meters below street level, the semi-liquid granite starts to sink in and to fill the cavities of the explosion. So here you have the stump of the south tower here you have the stump of the North Tower and have the rubble heap of Building 7. And nearby where these, near these, these stumps were uh, soft depressions. So, so, that's the three-dimensional map. Here, Silverstein Valley, the stumps. And next by these... Um, cavities as here also seen in other, as you would expect, yeah, south, north, and seven. Wow. All right. Why did you not hear about building six? <laughs> <laughs> did you say there was a building six? Well, there were many buildings destroyed in, the, in, in this area. So the, the entire complex here, every, everything in this complex was uh, utterly destroyed. So you have five destroyed, four destroyed, six destroyed, seven, two and one. But uh, two and one it was were just the most uh, well picturesque, so to speak, uh, in the destruction process. And building seven for so many the the the, 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 the smoking gun because building seven was two hundred meters high, whereas the Marriott Hotel and uh, building six they were not huge buildings; they were relatively small, forty meters about. So this is another. Okay, we have also an explanation for these sudden fires. So this is uh, eddy currents, changing magnetic fields, and the radiation angle, which I already uh, mentioned as well. The break of, F of energy if the towers are regarded as a Faraday cage, which, which suddenly liberate the electromagnetic energy. We have an excellent explanation by this process why the iron was transformed to dust and the paper stayed intact, simply because iron can uh, absorb a hard radiation and a certain wavelength and particle radiation. It is shattered, the crystal of iron is shattered into pieces, but paper, which cannot absorb the energy, just lets the energy through and nothing happens. So this is... Uh, a typical phenomena when you have a nuclear 
uh, explosion or process that the iron and concrete is pulverized. We have um, an explanation for the thermally active zones. This is also due to radioactive uh, processes and cooling down in, in the earth. And we have an, an explanation for the existence of these eruption channels uh, where still standing structures were visible. So the riddle of Dr. Judy Wood is solved. We have an explanation while the new structures which were built inside the bath and were extremely rusting after a few weeks already because we had a residual radiation inside and next to the bathtub and again the picture of people uh, cleaning clean objects. It's not the only one, they are also cleaning clean vehicles which are leaving. So this is a, a picture, a drawing from the state of the art. Actually we have uh, three, well, two water basins where the Twin Towers stood Silverstein Valley has been covered with concrete and we have a small water fountain where building uh, 7, the, the old building 7 had its heat center, it's also a water fountain and my interpretation is simply uh, Silverstein wanted to build a new building 7 if he had uh, placed a charge in the middle he couldn't have done that because the ground deformation would have been significant so he had to they had to shift the charge a bit aside, uh, which makes the thing for the planners really ugly and could explain why Building 7 decided not to fall, because it was not centered, it was the charge was placed not correctly, but Silverstein wanted his, his new building. Um, so the interpretation, the helping and artistic hand is directly responsible for the suffering, uh, and I have mentioned the Emperor Nero phenomena. We have uh, last step, step 25. Uranium in significant amounts is has been found in the dust. Also thorium has been found in the dust which uh, led me to believe that perhaps a breeding process of thorium and uranium was present but I dropped it because uh, we had to wait too long. But we observe a strong... Uh, thorium is uh, an element which is very near to uranium, so it's very, a very heavy element. And thorium, if it absor absorbs one neutron in a nuclear reactor, is transforming itself to uranium. So uh, you're getting more and more u uranium, and uranium is relatively expensive, and thorium is relatively cheap. So you just add thorium and the few lasts longer. <coughs> by a nuclear uh, yeah, reaction. We had on place a strong increase in cancers, especially a pronounced peak of thyroid cancers. Uh, this is due to the uranium fission product iodine. Only one, uh, one um, isotope is non-radioactive. Uh, if iodine comes from a nuclear process, mostly radioactive, isotopes will uh, produce, will be produced, and this iodine is also uh, stored in your thyroid and will, during decay, produce cancer. So if you have a nuclear reaction, um, you have a specific peak in these cancer cases, thyroid cancer cases, and they are present in the 9-11 uh, cancer cases. Okay. Um, Image to the left, this is the water basin next to building 7, the old hot spot. And I have found, uh, well it's actually 6 hours, uh, video documentation about rebuilding uh, ground zero. But the interesting thing is it contains silver fishes and I'm just playing the clip. So you yeah, have here the camera position, here's the destroyed World Trade Center, we are looking down into the into the cauldron and the camera uh, just registers these silver fishes and these rainbow reflections due to the radiation which is still uh, on site a few weeks after the event okay so silver fishes silver fishes, silver fishes. So 
uh, this is one of the destroyed building. I think it's uh, five. Five. <coughs> Here, the same situation by night, you see the flashes. Yeah, right up there. So these are workers on place, and you see here the silver flashes all over. So what are the silver flashes? Uh, uh, particle interaction with the camera. So it's a proof of for radioactive radiation. It's a proof for radioactive radiation. And how long after the event is this? Uh, this is a few weeks, I think. Yeah. We're still getting that. Right. Yeah. And also in the recreational or centers where they, they, they post is, of course, this radiation uh, present. Uh, so we didn't have lethal uh, radiation levels, but uh, if it's just 10 times the normal level, and you are living there and working there for over a, a prolonged period of time, you have a high probability in contracting cancer uh, if you are working in this radioactive cauldron. Even though the uranium uh, is deeply buried below your feet. 70,000 cases seems a lot. We are coming to this in the next okay. slide. Cancer is a business. I was surprised because the policy changed. Um, at first they made an, a, uh, a law to help the firefighters, but especially uh, excluding cancer from the, from the bill. So they let the people die. Now suddenly they changed the law, some pressure, perhaps also your work, my work, a tiny bit. And we have seven billion dollars in subsidies for these uh, for these people, but the numbers exploded. Suddenly, it is five hundred thousand people who are officially were exposed to the toxins on 9/11, and thirty-five thousand are officially still expected to contract cancer. And all these people, this is an official chart, who are inside this area, ground zero is here. Um, who had lived uh, in this area after 9/11 have access to this, uh, these, uh, to, to the money. So this is uh, an advertising. Hi, I'm Troy Rosasco. I'm a partner with Turley Hansen and Partners, and we're 9/11 Victims Compensation Fund lawyers. I'd like to take a few minutes today to talk to you about some of the most common 9/11 related illnesses. The most common 9-11 illnesses that I see today are cancers and breathing disorders. The most common cancers I see on a regular basis are skin cancers, prostate cancers, female breast cancer, and blood cancer. So these cancers are not from the asbestos, which will cause uh, cancer after one decade or two decades because they act not as a toxin or a radioactive element but uh, a mechanical stimulus so they are irritating the lung constantly so asbestos is a different story still to come so what do you do when you beat the insurance companies in court and they still won't pay because what we have here is something far worse. You know, in 1995, I wrote a book called Fighting Terrorism, and I said that if we don't arrest the tide of Islamic uh, militant terrorism, we, militant Islamic terrorism, then the next thing that will be is not a, a, a car bomb uh, in the uh, World Trade Center, uh, but uh, a nuclear bomb. Now, it wasn't a nuclear bomb. It was a 350-ton conventional bomb. <laughs> And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. A new governor was just elected. Elliot Spitzer, an old friend who I knew well. I said, Elliot, if you don't help me, I'll never collect from the insurance companies. 
And guess what? He listened and he said, you know what? You're entitled. I'm going to get you the money. And in six months, he got me the four and a half billion dollars. Joining me now here in the BBC World Studio is the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, uh, who's in London at the moment. Mr. Barak, welcome to BBC World. First, your reaction, having heard what's happened. At least four planes have been hijacked and uh, there may be more. The world will not be the same from today on. It's an attack uh, against our whole civilization. I don't know who is responsible. I believe we will know in 12 hours. If it is a kind of Bin Laden organization, and even if it's something else, I believe that this is the time to deploy a globally concerted effort led by the United States, the UK, Europe, and Russia against all sources of terror. 